Welcome to lecture number 16, the fundamentals of transport processes. So far we have been discussing transport in one dimension in Cartesian coordinates, where we solve problems using various methods. We started off with just steady diffusion in one dimension, in which case the velocity profile or the temperature profile or the concentration profile is just a linear function of, of, of position. That is because you have transport only in one dimension with no generation or consumption of heat, mass or momentum within the flow. That was at steady state where there is no dependence on time. One could also consider unsteady situations. In this case, we encounter partial differential equations, equations which depend both upon position as well as time. And we looked at a couple of ways of solving those equations. The first one was by a similarity transform. Similarity transform is particularly appropriate for transport into infinite media, because in that case there are no length or time scales in the problem. And therefore, one can use a similarity transform in order to reduce the equation from an ordinary dif uh, a partial differential equation in position and time to an ordinary differential equation. The second method that we looked at was separation of variables. And uh, I showed you how one can write a function of position and time into the product of two functions, one of which is only dependent on position, the other is only dependent on time. The variables are separated and you get both uh, uh, two uh, ordinary differential equations, one for the function of position, the other for the function of time. These have multiple solutions, discrete solutions with discrete eigenvalues and basis functions. And I showed you how to put them all together and use orthogonality relations to find out the solutions. We looked at oscillatory flows where we can use complex variables to simplify the, the equations and then solve them. And finally, we were looking at situations where there are sources or sinks within the flow. And in that case, one has to be, uh, one has either body forces, a source of heat as in the case of viscous heating or a source of uh, momentum due to body forces or a source of mass due to reactions. Now, the next step is to go to balances and cylindrical coordinates. Very often one encounters geometries which are cylindrical, for example, a pipe, a tubular reactor, a stirred tank vessel. These are all cylindrical geometries. One could analyze them in a Cartesian coordinate system. But however, in a Cartesian coordinate system, it is very difficult to write down the equation for the surface itself. Okay. So, for example, a circle in two dimensions will have an equation of the form x minus x c whole square plus y minus y c the whole square is equal to r square, where x c and y c are the centers of the circle and r is the radius. So, the surface has a complicated definition. Uh, the surface of a cylinder in Cartesian coordinates has a complicated definition, uh, very different from the definition that we had for plane surfaces. In plane surfaces, in all cases, our definition was just at z is equal to 0 and z is equal to h. So, if we use a cylindrical coordinate system, the definition of the surfaces gets considerably simplified in a cylindrical coordinate system. However, the equations are a little more complicated they have to take into account the fact that we are actually working with cylindrical surfaces and not flat surfaces. So, the next step is to look at how the equations are modified when you have cylindrical surfaces. But before that, I would just like to briefly uh, give a warning that much of what we did has to be modified in the case of mass diffusion due to the center of mass velocity okay, of, 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 of the entire system. Okay. So, a simple example to illustrate this multi-component diffusion. Okay. Let us say that we have a glass rod which is filled with water at the bottom. Okay. And then there is dry air going across the top. Because of the dryness of the air, there is going to be a flux of water coming from the top bottom to the top. Okay. 
So, let us take this as z is equal to 0, this z is equal to h. Okay. Now, this flux of water as it comes up, okay, uh, it is going to uh, get entrained by the air and go away. Okay. How is this flux related to the gradient in the concentration of water or the humidity of water? Okay. Simplistically, one would write the flux of water as minus d okay, times d c of water by d z is equal to minus d times the total concentration d x the mole fraction of water multiplied by T z. Okay. However, that is not all. Okay. There is also a motion due to the center of mass, there is a mean flow okay. and that mean flow is uh, 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 the, the, the mean flow okay, the total is equal to j of water plus j of air. Okay. So, there is a mean velocity because both water and air together are going upwards. Okay. So, this mean flow is also entraining some water with it, there is a motion of the center of mass and because of that you are going to have an additional term which is equal to the fraction of water times j water plus j air. Okay. So, this is equal to the fraction of water times j water plus j air. Okay. So, this now is going to be the equation. This term is the diffusion relative to the center of mass and this term is the entrainment of water due to the fact that water and air are moving. Okay. Strictly speaking in this problem water and air are moving in opposite directions. Okay. As the water gets evaporated, the surface of the water moves downwards and because of that air has to come in, okay. air has to come downwards okay, in order to displace the water that has been evaporated. Okay. You can imagine that if, the, if it was right at the top, as the surface comes downwards, air has to come in to fill the gap because the water is going out. So, strictly speaking there is actually a flux of air which is actually opposite in direction to the flux of water. Okay. However, this flux is actually small, the reason is as follows. When water evaporates, the volume of water vapor as I told you is about a thousand times larger than the volume of the water. Liquids have volumes that are about a thousand times less than the volume of, of gases the density of liquids is about a thousand times more than the density of gases. Okay. So, therefore, the volume of water displaced is actually small compared to the volume of the vapor that is coming out okay. and the volume of air going downwards is equal to the volume of the water that is displaced okay. and because of that the volume of air coming in can actually be considered to be small compared to the volume of water going downwards. However, there is still a mean flux upwards, okay. there is still a flux of water that is going upwards okay. and that is carrying uh, that center of mass motion of the water is has also to be accounted for when you calculate the flux. Okay. So, in this equation if I neglect the flux due to air, then I get an equation of the form 1 minus x w times j w is equal to minus d c dx w by d z and therefore, the flux j w is equal to minus d c by 1 minus x w dx w by d z where x w is the mole fraction of the water. So, note that this now has a different form, it is not just the gradient, it has 1 minus x w in the denominator. If the mole fraction is small then this will of course be small, but if the mole fraction is significant this has to be included in the balance equation. The fact that there is a mean motion has to be included in the balance equation as well. Okay. And if I write a balance between two locations okay, z plus delta z and z, right, 
the balance will just tell me that at steady state jw at z plus delta z minus jw at z will be equal to 0 at steady state. Okay. The flux going from one surface to the other has to be equal to 0 otherwise there will be an accumulation within that volume if the fluxes on both surfaces are not balanced. Okay. Written in differential form this is djw by dz is equal to 0 or d by dz of 1 by 1 minus xw dxw by dz is equal to 0. One can solve this equation quite easily okay, to get minus log of 1 minus x w is equal to a 1 z plus a 2. Okay. And then one has the boundary conditions. Okay. What are the boundary conditions in this case? Okay. At the surface itself, the concentration is equal to the saturation concentration of water. Okay. So, that x w is equal to x w s, okay. the saturation concentration of water vapor that is in equilibrium with the air at the temperature. Okay. Whereas, at z is equal to h, I have that C w is equal to 0 okay, or x w is equal to 0 okay, because it is dry air, it is dry air that is taking the moisture along with it. Therefore, the mo uh, mole fraction or the mass fraction of water in the air is equal to 0 at that top surface. So, I can solve this equation subject to these constraints okay. and the final uh, solution that I will get is that 1 minus x w by 1 minus x w s is equal to one by one minus x w s or z by h. Okay. So this is a more complicated dependence okay and that more complicated dependence comes about because in multi component diffusion problems one has to take into account the motion of the center of mass okay while while defining the flux itself. Okay the motion of the center of mass has to be taken into account while defining the flux and that accounts for this additional term in the conservation equation. Okay. So, therefore, when the volume fraction, the mass fraction, the mole fraction of the two components are roughly the same, one has to take into account the motion of the center of mass. Everything that we did for the concentration diffusion assumes that the, mole fr the, the fraction of the diffusing uh, component is actually small. In that case, one can linearize, okay. x w is small in this case, one can neglect that and just worry about gradients and concentration alone and only take into account this part of the equation. Okay. So, when you have multi component diffusion, one has to be careful about how to define fluxes. Okay. So, that is one thing to be kept in mind while dealing with mass transfer problems. We will not discuss this in further detail. Uh, I will only assume that the concentration diffusion equation is simply defined as I had done it earlier. The flux is equal to minus d dc by dz okay, and that simplifies the problem. Okay. Okay. The next topic transport in cylindrical coordinates. Let me draw for you a cylinder here. You can consider this as a section of a pipe or a reactor or, 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 or whatever. Okay. 
the coordinate system that we have been using so far okay, x z coordinate okay. Within this coordinate system, the definition of the surface of the cylinder, note that I placed my coordinate system at the center point of the cylinder, the axis of symmetry. Okay. Within this coordinate system, the surface of the cylinder, if the radius is r, surface of the cylinder is given by x square plus y square is equal to r square. Okay. This is inconvenient okay, to apply boundary conditions at a surface like this. Okay. So, therefore, this cylinder has an axis of symmetry. In this particular case, it is the z axis. Okay. As you go around the z axis, okay, nothing changes in the cylinder. Okay. And therefore, it would be more convenient to define a cylindrical coordinate system okay. and that is defined as follows. Okay, so, this was my original Cartesian coordinate system. In a cylindrical coordinate system, any point is defined by three coordinates. Okay. If I take this as the position vector of this point, okay, this is the position vector of this point, I can take the projection of this position vector onto the x y plane. Okay. So, this distance is r the distance of the projection of this vector onto the x y plane is r, okay. the height is z and this angle, the angle of the projection from the x axis is equal to theta. Okay. So, these are the three coordinates in the cylindrical coordinate system. The distance, okay, whether I take the distance of the projection or the distance of the point itself okay, from the z axis, both of these are equal to r. So, any point in space in a cylindrical coordinate system is defined by three coordinates. One is the z coordinate, the z is the height from the x y plane. Okay, so, this z coordinate is the height of the point from the x y plane. The r coordinate is the perpendicular distance from the z axis. Okay. From the z axis, if I draw a perpendicular to cut this point, then that distance is equal to r and theta is the distance of the projection of this uh, position vector from the x direction. It could be taken from any direction, but in general as a convention it is defined from the x direction. Okay. So, therefore, in a cylindrical coordinate system, the coordinates are r, theta and z. Okay. And these coordinates can be related to the equivalent coordinates in a Cartesian coordinate system. Okay. Clearly, the distance from the z axis is going to be equal to the square root of x square plus y square. Okay. The square root of x square plus y square is going to be the distance from the z axis. In the cylindrical coordinate system, z is just equal to z. Okay. And how is theta related? tan theta as you can clearly see is equal to y by x. Okay. So, this is the relation between the coordinates in the cylindrical coordinate system and in the Cartesian coordinate system. What is the advantage of using this cylindrical coordinate system? The big advantage is that if my z axis is along the axis of the cylinder, right, then this surface, this entire surface is one along which r is equal to a constant, okay. r is equal to r along this entire surface because it is a cylinder and all positions on the surface of that cylinder are equidistant from the axis of the cylinder. And therefore, rather than having this complicated boundary condition, I get a simple boundary condition in the form r is equal to capital R. So, it becomes easier to define the boundaries if the system has cylindrical uh, symmetry by using a cylindrical coordinate system.
Okay. So, now how do I do balances in a cylindrical coordinate system? Clearly, the, the, the shell balance that I did in the Cartesian coordinate system is going to be different here. In the case of the Cartesian coordinate system, the three coordinate planes were perpendicular to each other. So, I managed to take a cubic volume in order to, to do my balances. Okay. I managed to take a cubic volume for doing the balances. Clearly, when I have a cylindrical geometry, I cannot use that cubic volume. The cubic volume cannot be used when I have a cylindrical geometry, because it is not parallel to the coordinates in the cylindrical geometry. is not parallel to the coordinates in the cylindrical geometry. I have to use a volume that is parallel to the coordinates in the cylindrical geometry in order to the energy balance or the mass balance. Okay. So, let us take for definite less, let us take the mass balance. Okay. Uh, I will assume for the present, okay, we will uh, do away with that assumption later, but for the present I will assume that there is no variation in the theta direction. In other words, the temperature, velocity, concentration fields do not vary as I go around the z axis, so long as my distance from the z axis remains the same. So long as r remains the same and the z coordinate remains the same, nothing changes as I go around the z axis. Okay. So, that is an assumption I will make for now. We will see a little later how that uh, the results change if we relax that assumption. Okay. So, since nothing is changing as I go around the z axis, at a given distance r, I could use a cylindrical shell. Okay. This is a cylindrical shell of height delta z okay, and it is between radius r and r plus delta r. Okay. Let me draw it out in detail for you. If I look at this from the top of the cylindrical shell, it will look like two circles. So, this is a shell contained between the radius r and the radius r plus delta r. Okay. It is a cylindrical shell between the radius r and the radius r plus delta r of height h. Okay. So, this is the differential volume that I will consider for doing the balance. So, what is the balance equation? Okay. the rate of accumulation of mass, the accumulation of mass within the cylindrical shell in time delta t okay, is going to be equal to input of mass minus output. Plus any sources. Okay, so, that is the balance equation for the mass conservation. The volume that we consider for this is this volume, the volume between the inner and the outer cylinder, between r and r plus delta r. Okay. So, what is the accumulation of mass within this shell? Okay. in time delta t. Okay. 
this is going to be equal to the concentration okay, at R z t plus delta t minus the concentration at R z t times the volume. The volume in this case is equal to 2 pi r delta r okay. the area of this cross section is going to be equal to the circumference times the thickness the thickness is delta r the circumference is 2 pi r so therefore this area is 2 pi r delta r times the height which is delta z So, this is the accumulation within the time delta t. Okay. Now, how about the input and the output of mass? Okay. In this cylindrical volume, okay, there is an input of mass at the surface at r due to the flux j r at r. Okay. There is also an output due to the flux j r at r plus delta r. Okay, so, there is an input at r and an output at r plus delta r and both of these have to be incorporated in the mass balance equation. What is the input of mass? At r is equal to j r times the surface area. The surface area for the input of mass is this cylindrical surface area. Okay, it's the cylindrical surface area is the surface area for the input of mass. Therefore, this cylindrical surface area is 2 pi r times delta z. This at the location r. Okay. What about the output of mass at r plus delta r? I am sorry, this has to be multiplied by delta t because flux is mass per unit area per unit time. So, for the input of mass, I have to take the flux multiplied by the curved surface area multiplied by time. The output of mass is equal to j r 2 pi r delta z at the location r plus delta r times delta t. Okay. Let me point out one thing here itself. Okay. The input of mass is through this surface area. The output of mass is through this surface area the two surface areas are not the same because the two radii are not the same. Okay. In this case of the flow in Cartesian coordinates, whether I take the top surface or the bottom surface, the areas are the same because they are in Cartesian coordinates. In cylindrical coordinates, the surface areas of the two cylindrical surfaces are not the same. That is going to be important okay, when we do the mass, uh, mass conservation condition. Okay. So, therefore, my equation becomes I have an accumulation within the volume and I have the input and the output. Okay. There is an additional source okay. and that is of the form S times the volume. S was defined as amount of mass created per unit volume per unit time. Therefore, the source of mass is going to be S times the volume which is 2 pi r delta r delta z times delta t. Okay. So, therefore, this accumulation of mass in time delta t has to be balanced by the input, output and the source. So, I will have C of x y of r 
r z t plus delta t minus c of r z t okay. into the area into the volume which is 2 pi r delta r delta z is equal to j r into 2 pi r delta z at r plus delta r I am sorry it should be an input here. So, at r times delta t minus j r into 2 pi r delta z at r plus delta r into delta t plus s into 2 pi r delta r delta z delta t. Okay. Note that I have kept the radius Note that I have kept the radius within okay, r plus delta r and r because this is at r plus delta r, this one is at r and the two are different. Okay. So, we divide throughout by two pi r delta r delta z delta t okay and this becomes c at r z t plus delta t minus c at r z t by delta t This is equal to 1 by r, 1 by delta r okay, of r times j r at r minus r times j r at r plus delta r okay, plus s. Okay. Once again, In this equation, 2 pi is a constant, 2 pi is a constant, so it can be taken out. Okay. Delta z is also independent of r, okay. delta z is just the height, it does not matter whether the surface is at r or to r plus delta r, the height is the same, it is independent of r. Okay. Therefore, delta z and 2 pi can both be taken out, okay. but however, this r depends upon r, so that has to be taken into account when you do the differentiation. Okay, so, that is the basic okay, issue. Okay. Now, if I take the limit delta t and delta r going to 0, this equation becomes d c by d t is equal to 1 by r t by d r of r j r plus s. Okay. Note that this is slightly more complicated than the form that we had earlier. Okay. It is a negative sign because I am taking the value at r minus the value at r plus delta r. Okay. This is more complicated because as I said earlier, the surface area is changing as a function of position and because of that even if the flux does not change the mass that is transferred will change because the surface area is changing. The total mass transfer is equal to the flux times the area. So, there is one component of the, of the mass due to the change in the flux, there is another component of the mass due to the change in the surface area and this is inescapable in the case of cylindrical coordinates. You will end up with a more complicated form for the mass conservation equation simply because the surface area is changing as the radius is changing. And then I can use the constitutive relation for the flux, 
j r is equal to minus d times partial c by partial r okay, j r is equal to minus d times partial c by partial r okay, to finally get an equation for the concentration field okay, partial c by partial t is equal to d into 1 by r t by dr of r dc by dr plus s. So, this is the mass conservation equation for unidirectional transport in a cylindrical coordinate system. Okay. Contrast this with with the equation that I had for the Cartesian coordinate system, which is the form dc by dt is equal to d times partial square c by partial z square plus s. So, the difference is that this operator which was just a second derivative in the Cartesian coordinate system now has a more complicated form in a cylindrical coordinate system. Okay, so, that is the big difference between Cartesian and cylindrical coordinates. Okay. One could do this quite easily for the energy balance equation. Okay you will get exactly the same result except that you substitute T for C and the thermal diffusivity for the mass diffusivity. Okay. So, the equation for that will be of the form dc by dt is equal to alpha plus a source term. Okay. So, this is for thermal diffusivity for the temperature field it has exactly the same form except that the mass diffusivity is substituted for the thermal diffusivity. Okay. How about momentum transfer? Okay. When we did Cartesian coordinates, okay, invariably we took a configuration like this x, z, the velocity was in the x direction. So, the velocity was u x and that was a function of the z coordinate. Okay. So, the velocity is tangential to the surfaces. Okay. So, it is uh, uh, the variation in velocity is perpendicular to the surfaces whereas, the velocity itself is parallel to the surfaces. In our cylindrical coordinate system, there are two possible ways that we could take the velocity okay, which is parallel to the surface. One is for the velocity to be in the tangential direction along the theta axis. Okay. So, in other words, if I had a cylinder in which there was a swirling flow, okay, then if I look from the top, the velocity is actually in this theta direction. Okay. The velocity is in the theta direction. So, I will have a velocity u theta which is non-zero. Okay. This is uh, relevant for rotating flows within cylindrical geometries. Okay. I could also have a velocity which is parallel to the surfaces, but which is in the z direction. Okay. So, there are two directions that are parallel to the surfaces. Since the surface is at constant r, there are two directions parallel to the surfaces, one at constant uh, one along the theta direction, the other along the z direction. This is relevant for circulating flows in cylinders. This is relevant for example, for a pipe flow. You have a flow along the axis. So, you could have a flow either along the axis or around the axis okay. and one could write different momentum balance for each of these. Okay. The pipe flow along the axis is usually encountered in, in combination with a pressure gradient along the pipe okay. because uh, the requirement in this case is that the flow at the walls itself is equal to 0. Okay. So, therefore, this is usually encountered in, in combination with the pressure gradient along the pipe axis. Okay. Uh, flow uh, the, the velocity at the wall itself has to be 0. If the pipe is bounded by a rigid wall, then the velocity of the fluid at the wall itself has to be equal to 0. And the velocity will have a parabolic profile as we will see a little later. Swirling flows are usually encountered when you have some circulation 
either at the wall or one could also have an annular region. Okay. One could have an annular region between two plates okay, in which one of them moves with one velocity, the other is moving with another velocity and one could have a velocity of the fluid in between. Okay. So this is another type of uh, profile that is seen whenever you have rotating cylinders. Okay. And uh, one can write momentum balance equations for both of these. Okay. The momentum balance equation for the swirling flow is actually quite easy, it is just analogous to this. Partial u theta by partial t is equal to the kinematic viscosity times 1 over r. plus any force in the f direction divided by the density itself. Okay. So this is the solution for a swirling flow. Um, the solution for flow along the axis we will see when we deal with pressure gradients a little later. Okay. We will explicitly look at the flow down uh, along a pipe and derive the momentum balance equation for that flow. So that we will see a little later. Okay. So in cylindrical coordinates these are the mass, momentum and energy balance equations. Okay. And they are similar to what you get in Cartesian coordinates except that the derivative, the viscous derivative operator or the diffusion term is more complicated. It contains an additional contribution due to the fact that the surface area is increasing as the radius increases and because of that you have an additional uh, a slightly more complicated term in the uh, uh, diffusion term in the equation. Okay. So now let us solve this, these equations for some simple cases. The simplest case to consider of course is steady diffusion. In cylindrical coordinates, the simplest case to consider is the steady diffusion along the wall of a pipe. Okay. Let us say that the pipe has an inner radius, let me draw it bigger, it has an inner radius which is Ri outer radius is R. Okay. You can consider this as for example the wall of a shell and tube heat exchanger. There is hot fluid flowing inside, there is cold fluid flowing outside. So the temperature on the inner surface is Ti, the temperature on the outer surface is T0, okay, T outer. And our task is to find out what is the heat flux as a function of the difference in temperatures and the radius. Okay, the radius of the two, two sides. Okay. So you have to solve the mass conservation equation in order to get this difference in the, the heat flux. Okay. So my conservation equation at steady state, okay, if I just neglect uh, uh, variations in time and consider steady state alone, my conservation equation is of the form alpha times 1 by r t by dr of r dt by dr is equal to 0 provided there are no sources or sinks within the flow. Okay. And now I can non-dimensionalize the variables. Okay. Uh, I can choose either Ri or Ro to non-dimensionalize the variables because ultimately what will matter is only the ratio of the two radii. Okay. So I can choose either of them to non-dimensionalize the variables. Okay. So I will choose R star is equal to R by Ri and T star is equal to T minus T i by T o minus T i. Okay. I should note that you cannot just set one boundary at that R is equal to 0, at R star is equal to 0. So in this case, the boundary conditions become at R star is equal to 1 t star is equal to 0 at r star is equal to 
R O by R i T star is equal to 1. Okay. So, at the outer surface T star T is equal to T 0, so T star becomes 1. At the inner surface T is equal to T i, so T star becomes 0. The surfaces are at R star is equal to 1 and R star is equal to the ratio of the two radii. Previously, we always took one surface at z star is equal to 0 okay, and the other is at z star is equal to h. Even if the value of z itself was some other value, I could just subtract out a constant length and reduce the surface to 1 at z star is equal to 0. In this case, I cannot do that. At r is equal to 0, the surface area becomes 0 because 2 pi r dr is the surface area of the surface. Okay. So, I have to have uh, a surface between two finite values of r okay, whenever I do the calculations. Okay. Okay. So, my differential equation expressed in terms of this is 1 over r star d by dr star of r dt by dr is equal to 0. So, if I integrate once, I will get r dt by dr is equal to c1, some constant of integration or dt by dr is equal to c1 by r, which implies that t is equal to c1 log r plus c2. Note that this is a diffusion dominated system. We do not have a linear profile in this case. The reason is because the surface area is changing as a function of radius and therefore, if you have diffusion dominated transport in a Cartesian coordinate system, we just got a linear variation. In this case, we do not get a linear variation. It is a logarithmic variation. Okay. And C1 and C2 can be solved subject to boundary conditions to get T star is equal to log of R by log of R o by R i. You can easily see that when R star is equal to 1, T star is equal to 0. When R star is equal to R o by R i, then T star is equal to 1 okay, as required by these boundary conditions. Okay, as required by these boundary conditions, this solution satisfies these two boundary conditions. So, I have chosen C 1 and C 2 in such a way that these two boundary conditions are satisfied. So, this is the temperature profile. Okay. If I express it back in terms of dimensional variables, this is T minus T i by T o minus T i is equal to log of R by R i by log of R o by R i. So, that is the dimensional solution. Okay. What we were ultimately after was the heat flux. Okay. So, how do we calculate the heat flux in this case? Okay. The heat flux Q r is equal to minus k times d t by d r. Okay. And using my non dimensionalization, this is equal to minus k to T naught minus T i by R i partial T star by partial R star. Okay. And using this expression for uh, um, and using this expression for T star, I can easily get the final solution as minus k to T naught minus T i by R i R star into log of okay. And since R star is equal to R by R i, this is also equal to minus k to T naught minus T i by R log of R o by R i. Okay. So, this is the heat flux 
okay. this is the heat flux total heat coming out okay, out of the cylindrical surface. Okay. The total heat is going to be equal to the surface area okay, okay, the total heat coming out of any surface is going to be equal to the surface area of that surface times the flux. Okay. The surface area is equal to 2 pi r times the height okay, in the perpendicular direction of this. Okay. So, if I take a height uh, uh, a length L of this tube of the heat exchanger, then the total heat coming out is going to be equal to 2 pi r L into minus k T naught minus T i by r log of r o by r i. And you can see that the r cancels out and I just get minus k T naught minus T i okay, times 2 pi L by log of r o by r i. Okay. Note this total heat coming out is independent of R. Okay. The heat flux that I had was dependent upon R. Okay. The expression for the heat flux that I had was dependent upon R. It, in fact, it went as 1 over R. Okay. The heat flux went as 1 over R. The surface area is proportional to R. So, the total heat coming out of any surface is exactly the same. Okay, it is independent of the radius. Okay. Now, one can use this to define an average flux. Okay. The flux itself is dependent upon R. Okay. As I told you, the flux itself is dependent upon R. Okay. In, uh, in this expression, the flux depends upon R, okay. but the total heat coming out is not dependent upon R. So, the, so, I can define an average flux okay, as q r average okay, is equal to q by 2 pi um, two pi l into some average. And this I can write it as k times t naught minus t i by r naught minus r i okay, times some function. Okay. So, therefore, this average radius okay, is effectively going to be equal to the logarithmic average okay, of the inner and the outer cylinder radii. Okay. So, if I define the, the, the average heat flux as q by 2 pi r into r naught minus r i, then I will get the average uh, heat flux, uh, the average area coming out okay, as q by a. Then it implies that the area is equal to 2 pi times L into R naught minus R i divided by the log of R naught minus R i, R naught pi R i. Okay. So, therefore, the actual radius of the surface at which the, the, the average uh, flux is calculated is actually the logarithmic mean of the surface. So, this is the log law okay, for the heat transfer from a cylindrical pipe. Okay. So, logarithmic law for the heat transfer from a cylindrical pipe. Okay. And this, uh, this logarithmic mean is simply because I showed you that the heat flux goes as log of r. Okay. Uh, the reason is because the surface area is changing. So, instead of having a, a dependence on r itself, the heat flux goes as log of r. 
and because of that when you calculate the average area it is not the mean area of the surface itself for the transfer, but rather the logarithmic mean of the area for the transfer. Okay. So, this briefly is the fundamentals of the transport in cylindrical coordinate systems. I derived for you the transport equation and I showed you the complication is because in a, in a cylindrical coordinate system the surface area changes with radius and because of that the conservation equation has a more complicated form in this case. Okay. The, compli okay. the conservation equation has a more complicated form. Instead of having the d square c by dz square which I had earlier, I get a more complicated form of the conservation equation. And in cylindrical coordinates, if I have two surfaces at two different radii with the temperature difference between them, the temperature profile in between these two is not linear, it is logarithmic. Okay. And because of that, the, heat, the, the, the flux equation for the flux, the area that you take should be the logarithmic mean. Okay. Next class, we will go back to looking at how we do unsteady problems. Okay. Start with the simplest case for Cartesian coordinates, the similarity solution, and then I will show you how to do separation of variables in cylindrical coordinates. Okay. Methods are exactly the same, the functions are more complicated. In the previous case, I just had a second derivative and therefore, I got sin and cosine as the basis functions. In this case, I do not have a second derivative, the basis functions will be more complicated. Then we will look at pipe flows and look at how to study oscillatory flows. So, we will continue our discussion of cylindrical coordinates in the next class. We will see you then.